My name is Diego Arciniegas, and I'm a senior lecturer in the Theater Studies Department. Between what we're calling this event a uh, faculty lecture and my job title and description, senior lecturer, one would think that what I do here at Wellesley and what I'm going to do here at this lecture is lecture. Um, when if you ever came to one of my classes, which incidentally I conduct as an open classroom in a theater, so anybody and everybody is welcome to sit in in any of my classes. Uh, I conduct it as an open classroom specifically so that my students have the experience of a changing audience all the time. So uh, anytime you're at Wellesley um, and you know my class schedule, I'm teaching on Mondays this, this year, um, please drop by, sit in, watch. Um, if you did drop by, sit in, and watch, you would find out that lecturing is kind of the last thing I do. Um, I'm hoping, in fact, to turn uh, this into a little bit of a conversation and leave some time for um, conversation and questions. And I want to try to stay true to the tenets of my own discipline. I'm more interested in wrestling with a question before you and serving up the problems it poses or the implications it may have for you to talk about and hopefully continue to wrestle with it after you leave this room. What I actually do is teach performance, which if it were to have a proper description, it would fall somewhere between practical philosopher and gym coach. The specifics of which I'm going to get into a little bit later, but when anybody asks me what I do, uh, the mischievous side of me likes to say I'm a practical aesthetician uh, and then wait for the uh, reaction. But I never actually do that because I'm half afraid that they're going to think that what I do is involved with hygiene or beauty products. Uh, but right from the get-go, I'm, I'm, I'm saddled with this problem or the question that is today's topic. If we can't even come up with a proper or accurate title for what it is that I do, what am I or anybody in my field doing at a liberal arts college? Is there room for the teaching of the performing arts within the curriculum of a liberal arts college? And if so, what form does it or should it take? Is it the same as what you do in a conservatory or a performance training program? How does it serve the larger purpose of the liberal arts? Or should it even have to explain itself? What about art for art's sake? What do you think? What does a student of performance do anyway? Do they just do the thing? Do they study the doing of the thing? Do they study the history of those who did the thing? What do we mean anyway when we say we teach Theater. And for the purposes of this discussion, I'd like to define theater as all the performing arts or anything that traditionally takes place in a theater or in a performance space, dance, music, opera, any kind of vocal performance, any kind of musical instrument performance, etc. In a conservatory program, the answer is quite simple. They learn on their feet. They do the thing while they're studying the thing that they are doing with historical context, aesthetic theory, and any other kind of analysis that supplements but does not take precedence over the doing of the thing. But at a liberal arts college, a scholarly environment, should the emphasis be different? As a theater professional arriving at Wellesley 18 years ago, I saw myself tasked with the responsibility of training liberal arts students to compete effectively against their BFA or Bachelor of Fine Arts conservatory trained counterparts at professional auditions, for places at graduate training programs, etc. I came from the theater arts division at Emerson College and the Masters of Music program and the musical theater division at the Boston Conservatory of Music. I felt the need to balance this conservatory style approach with an appropriate learning experience for those who might be interested in theater, uh, but not necessarily, not perforce intending it as a career, and yet leaving enough room for those that might. I'm going to get a little into the weeds about my particular discipline, acting, for the purposes of demonstrating how this kind of curriculum can challenge a liberal arts student in ways that they might never have been challenged before at least if they haven't had any other performance art 
arts training, which is increasingly uh, the case in this country. Staying true to the tenets of my own profession, however, I am going to ask you to use your own imagination to explore how the liberal arts student in your life might react to and hopefully grow with and when faced with this kind of curriculum. The first thing I do in class is place the art of acting in its proper context. Because of the overnight success of film and television stars in popular culture, I need to address the misperception that training, practice, observation, and repetition are less important in theatrical performance than they are in other art forms, such as ballet, voice, and instrumental performance, where practice is a common occurrence. Nobody ever says, hey, brain surgery, I think I'll try it. I say provocatively on the first day of class. Um, and I say it because just about everyone does assume that they can leap onto a stage and achieve success at the first attempt. However wryly I'm making this case, I'm preparing students for what will be a long struggle to achieve authenticity on stage, a struggle in which they will engage for the duration of the semester and in which I claim expertise only by dint of a few additional years of experience. I downplay my own authority on the subject, which is perhaps the opposite of what you expect at a liberal arts college. I want to model the humility with which the discipline must be approached. I want the student to develop her own artistic sensibility rather than rely upon mine for the reassurance of a right or a wrong answer. This can stump many students who are good at doing what is expected of them in school. Most importantly, I do it to emphasize I am teaching a process that requires continual refinement instead of a body of knowledge to be commanded as soon as it is comprehended. This is a huge department, de departure from academic practice. It's not enough to understand. You must master. I warn that in a discipline such as this, comprehension offers no guarantee of mastery. And to underscore the point, I inform them that they will learn everything they need to know about acting on the first day, but will spend the remainder of the semester wrestling with the implications. I invoke Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour maxim to manage expectations. My goal for the end of the semester is to leave them with a methodology which, if pursued beyond the course, will result in an independent minded performer with a personal aesthetic compass. I recently discovered leading off with Aristotle was very helpful, since he serves as a point of departure in other Wellesley courses. I explain his distinction between theoria, poesis, and praxis, and how he connects them to different kinds of knowledge. While the students' other courses might fall under the category of theoria, and while poesis might seem the logical category to comprise acting, I point out it is only praxis which leads to action. I could go into a deeper exploration of these three categories, but I'm, um, if people have questions about this, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. I don't want to get too far in the weeds. Um, but the point is, it is praxis and not poesis which leads to action. We are called actors, I tell them. We're not poets. We act. I explain that while creativity is crucial, acting is not a creative, but an interpretive art. The playwright, the choreographer, the composer are the creative artists. Poesis comprises their various endeavors, which continue to exist on the written page long after the curtain has gone down. The actor, the dancer, the musician inhabit and interpret someone else's poetic work for a moment in time, giving it life in a way that neither the written word nor a musical notation can achieve. This heptic or kinesthetic knowledge can find new meaning in this creative work and occasionally even make it better. I use Barbara Streisand and her famous recording of People as an example. At a given moment in the melody, Barbara jumped to a higher note than composer Julie Stein had originally intended. Stein claimed she made his song better. Now, Barbara is not a composer. Nor does she claim to be, but her tactile journey through the piece brought her to an understanding of the melody even its creator agreed was superior. Mozart, a piano prodigy as well as a composer, is alleged to have done the same thing to a tune of Salieri's as is documented in Peter Schaffer's play Amadeus, but also noted by musicologists and historians. It's a, it's a, true, it's a true thing. Peter Schaffer did not make this up. 
I follow this observation with a joke to bring things back to earth. How do you get to Carne Hall, Carnegie Hall? Praxis, praxis, praxis. <laughs> I know, it's a bad joke. But I do find that alternating between theoretical and theatrical concepts helps students to understand performance is knowledge in action and that the theater can serve as a conduit of ideas for a culture to engage in critical thought. In this manner, I tie the practice of, fine, of a fine art into the context of a liberal arts education. I also discovered that I needed to disabuse students of the misguided but common notion that acting is uh, feigning. It's imitating an emotion not genuinely felt and that some sort of deception is required. This is an understandable misperception as it rather accurately describes the acting style of the early 19th century. It is actually uh, a testament to, uh, and, and, and there's no better proof of Konstantin Stanislavski, the revolutionary 19th century uh, stage theoretician, that his acting technique is indeed so radical a notion that today it still needs to be explained. Ra and I'm going to attempt to do that in, 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 uh, rather briefly. Rather than feigning an emotion, I explain an actor is an emotional athlete who puts honestly arising emotion to the service of actions not intended to arouse feeling or sentiment at all. The performer on stage, their action meets an obstacle, a competing action from another character perhaps. Conflict, the driving force of dramatic action ensues. True emotion emerges out of that conflict to a degree that is directly proportional to the amount of commitment invested in the originating action. It is the action, not the emotion, that is the focus of the actor's attention and effort. I use my morning commute as an example. My intention is to get to Wellesley. My action to drive meets the obstacle, the other drivers in my way. Suddenly, I'm not trying to have an emotion. I'm trying to manage one. The same holds true on the stage, despite its reputation for histrionics. To paraphrase Konstantin Stanislavski, at no time on the stage should there ever be any action undertaken for the purpose of the arousal of an emotion for its own sake. It's what we call self-indulgence in performance. Once I'm reasonably convinced that this action-based concept is understood, the remainder of the semester is devoted to scene work, in which students and I mount scenes, identify actions, eliminate emotive impulses, encounter obstacles, and invest the resultant emotions into successive actions. Because this discipline develops and challenges emotional intelligence, an aptitude for which neither the SAT nor the ACT has any real predictive capability, many students can encounter course demands they find uncomfortable in ways they have never experienced before. I talk about discomfort as a part of learning on the first day of class. Don't take this course, I say, if you're not good at not being good at something. I talk about how performance training is based on a model of failure. I actually equate it to scientific method where a working hypothesis is continually expanded and modified as it meets with failure in the laboratory. I quote the motto of the Brown University Trinity Square, Trinity Square Repertory Theater um, company, uh, risk, fail, risk again. I tell the story of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, asked how to write a great novel like 100 Years of Solitude, replying, you have to write 100 bad ones first. Nevertheless, students accustomed to success in a variety of academic disciplines can find themselves at a loss when encountering such directives as, let go more, try not to premeditate, think less, Try to loosen up on your sense of control. Give yourself permission to acknowledge the emotion you are actually experiencing. Now, I've learned to, I hope I've learned to calibrate the intensity of these demands to the level of experience or the emotional sophistication of the student. And I don't always succeed. Sometimes the student encountering an inability to achieve a desired outcome I, results in frustration. I've, I've noticed that this. Uh, occurs most frequently when I've not found a way to relieve the sometimes enormous pressure the student places upon herself. In many instances, it might be the student's first taste of failure. 
I'm constantly looking for new ways to help the student manage her perceptions of failure and her perception of herself as a result of that failure. I empathize from my own professional experience, equating the pressure the student feels to the pro professional actor's concern regarding press reviews. The performing arts are the only line of work, I tell them, where you can have a bad day at the office and they write about it in the newspaper. <laughs> External pressures like those of a bad review or the fear of a bad grade cannot be allowed to color the work. I talk about the dangers in performance of wanting a specific outcome too much. I tell them I would rather see a noble failure than a safe, facile success. I point out the paradox of performance that results can only be achieved by indirect means. If emotion is the byproduct of action, success cannot be achieved by applying pressure or additional effort. There is a delicacy involved, a balance to be achieved. Trying too hard can lead to failure as easily as not trying hard enough. This is a completely novel concept to the liberal arts student who has little or no artistic training. We tell our children if they work hard enough, they will succeed far more often than we caution them against throwing more energy at a task than it requires. A performer is expected to acquire a skill, a technique, and an understanding through continuous repetition, throw it all away in performance, and rely on the training to manifest itself reflexively for a split second performative decisions. It's when I'm addressing these issues that I'm most grateful for the number of athletes who take my courses. I've been speaking largely as a practical philosopher up until now. Here comes the gym coach. Um, I've, I suspect these athletes uh, recommend this course to one another because they find often to their own surprise that they possess transferable skills and coping mechanisms that can model uh, that can model the struggle with failure an actor encounters in the rehearsal hall. Athletes understand action and conflict. They are comfortable in their bodies. They even have experience managing emotion that arises out of play. I make the case that some performing arts are closer to some sports, and certain sports, baseball in my opinion, combine training and spontaneous action in a way that closely approximates, if not entirely achieves, artistry. It's right about here that I should insert this, that this distinction between knowledge and physical action is a departure from both Aristotle and the original concept of the liberal arts, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, or the trivium as they're called. Rhetoric in its entirety is rarely taught at liberal arts institutions. English, philosophy, and classics departments have shouldered the responsibility for teaching important aspects of rhetoric but they do not cover all five canons. Inventio, dispositio, elocutio, memoria, pronuntiatio. Uh, I don't want to get too far into these elements of rhetoric. Beyond pointing out that elocution, memoria, and pronuntiatio are rarely taught at liberal arts in a liberal arts education as important pathways to knowledge. And perhaps a women's college is not a particularly appropriate location to launch a call for the reintroduction of elocution lessons. It summons too vivid an image of women balancing books on their heads. But we are only recently seeing that some of these pathways to knowledge or intelligences are being reintroduced by other names and other pedagogical constructs, such as the work of Howard Gardner and his theory of multiple intelligences. They are verbal, logical, mathematical, spatial, visual, bodily, kinesthetic, musical intelligence, which he defines as the ability to produce and appreciate rhythm, pitch, and timbre. Interpersonal intelligence, the capacity to detect and respond appropriately to the moods, motivations, and desires of others. Intrapersonal intelligence, the capacity to be self-aware and in tune with inner feelings, values, beliefs, and thinking process. Naturalist intelligence, the ability to recognize and categorize plants, animals, and other objects in nature. Existential intelligence, sensitivity and capacity to tackle deep questions about human existence, such as what is the meaning of life? Why do we die? How, do we, how did we get here? I would argue that teaching theater, as I've defined it, addresses and develops these intelligences which are underrepresented in college curricula. 
but do exist in extracurricular form on college campuses. It is precisely the, because of the lack of sophistication with or development of these other intelligences, the business leaders today complain that recent college graduates lack the qualities they are looking for in an employee. I believe that the attractiveness and the uniqueness of the American residential college experience owes its status in no small part to the fact that, at least extracurricularly, these other intelligences and skill sets can find a forum in the sports teams, sport, uh, club sports, and campus performance groups. So those are the, the basic thoughts that I have wanted to throw out for discussion. And uh, I just wanted to close sort of the more formal parts of my remarks um, by suggesting a couple of things that I've done in the past here at Wellesley. And it's been an opportunity for me, um, working with colleagues at Wellesley, to address some of these issues. Uh, th theatrical performance training, it turns out, in my view, is more teaching a way of learning rather than a self-contained discipline in and of itself. And through the team teaching program here at Wellesley College, I've been able to pair up with faculty members from a variety of different disciplines to address um, specific topics. Um, I'm, I'm Latin American in origin. Uh, Spanish is my first language. And I have twice worked with Carlos Ramos in the Spanish department teaching performance in a Spanish class in Spanish, uh, introducing uh, students to the notion of verse uh, in Spanish. The verse structure is different in Spanish than it is in English. They don't use high iambic pentameter. They're very fond of the Alexandrine. Um, exp explaining and teaching them how to perform in verse in Spanish does a variety of things. It helps them with pronunciation, of course. It helps them with comprehension. But it also not only exposes them to some of the best literature of the language, but it actually makes them capable of feeling what that language feels like when coursing through your body. They're the best possible examples of the language. And so uh, in terms of language acquisition, it actually helps them uh, in, in that area. But I've, and I, I have it only on my colleagues say so, but I trust him. He says that the papers that he is, he is reading when compared to papers from previous semesters are actually far more insightful, not necessarily because they're uh, sophisticated intellectually, but the kernel of the idea is more genuine, more original, more spontaneous as a result of their kinesthetic trip through a play rather than reading it. Now, this is not to say that there is no place for analysis in a liberal arts curriculum. I don't want to go too far in the opposite direction. But there should be, and is, fortunately here at Wellesley, a place for that kind of learning to happen. Um, in that discipline. Uh, I've also uh, had the opportunity, oh, I'm going to have the opportunity next semester to do the same sort of thing with a professor in the classics department, Kate Jehuli. We're going to take a look at Lysistrata. We're going to mount the entire play. And she's going to be going into the original text and looking at the actual translation to find what is the most resonant word choice for the script that we are going to compile. And the students are going to be right along with us uh, working through that process. So they're going to have. A, a deep dive into uh, not only the classics on Lysistrata, but how it's performed and how that makes them feel about this particular piece of literature. Uh, a small thing about Lysistrata, it was originally performed only by men. Uh, and the plot of the play is essentially women refusing to have sex with their husbands until they stop going to war. Uh, and it's going to be performed but at a women's college by all women playing all the parts that were originally all played by men. I can go into uh, greater detail, but we can talk about that later if you'd like. So these are the kinds of projects that theater as a learning tool can actually invest into other curricula and really create the interdisciplinary approach to learning that we are seeing that really is the future in liberal arts colleges. It is that kind of synthetic thinking, that kind of playful thinking that actually um, is going to create the kind of thinkers that they need, not only in the arts, but in industry, in any, basically in, in any field. So um, another thing that I've done, I've experimented with uh, online courses as well. I, I, I was uh, presented with a challenge that uh, online courses, first of all, are a threat to the American residential college system and also um, can only uh, help 
teach concrete operational things like, oh, I don't know, uh, electrical circuitry and computer programming and stuff like that. And in conjunction with uh, Professor Eugene Ko of the English department, we put together an online course um, in uh, Shakespeare performance, uh, which has its technical side. And I would, it helped me understand the role of um, online courses in, uh, in higher education. And in my opinion, it's a wonderful form to expand the reach of education, particularly in the areas of introduction, um, form, but when you get to the higher levels of sophistication in just about any discipline, you probably need a human being in front of you or at least interacting with you in a way that conveys all the imperceptible things that you just can't get across a uh, camera screen. So those are just a couple of ways in which uh, theater, here at Wellesley in particular, um, in, uh, interacts with uh, the, the more scholarly uh, departments, uh, but it differs enormously from uh, where I started teaching in a performing arts conservatory. Uh, and I see the value of both, and I'm proud to say that several of our um, uh, graduates compete quite effectively with um, the graduates of uh, um, conservatory uh, style training. And so with that, um, I'd love to open this up more for conversation and discussion if there's any particular area in uh, what I talked about that you'd like to bring back up, because um, I know I threw a lot out there uh, for discussion. Yes? Well, you ended with uh, a little discussion of comparing different conservatory training. Um, and, and you've made the argument uh, about performing arts in a liberal arts college. Then it sounds as if you fully support kind of the opposite argument, that there's great benefit in studying the performing arts in a liberal arts college, that the what the general liberal arts bring to the performing arts student, that that student might not get in a conservatory. Yes. Um, I, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, well, right. but um, it has been my experience, and I, and I actually talked to my students uh, a fair amount about this. I find that the student from a conservatory performing arts program can read the phone book, uh, a good one, uh, the, a phone book or the instruction labels uh, on a soup can and make it interesting. But they won't necessarily know whether or not it's good writing unless they had that natural ability when they came into the program. Uh, there are liberal arts courses in performing arts courses, but their, um, the, the, the focus is on performance. They're, they're supplementary, but they, uh, they, they do not hold the same category of importance. And, and what I find is, in exchange for that, the um, conservatory student spends an awful lot of time working on their craft. They're far more vocally and physically flexible than the average liberal arts student coming out, but the average liberal arts student understands what she needs to do to get there. She takes the yoga classes, she takes the voice and training workshops and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, and this is, this, this is the same argument that is made for the liberal arts in, in all disciplines, if, you've, if you're looking at a long-term strategy, the kind of learning that happens at a liberal arts college stands you in better stead even in the performing arts as it does in um, other disciplines, in my opinion. Yes. I, I really love your idea of, uh, of the importance of failure. Mm. Um, you know, I think so many people go to these elite schools who have gotten, you know, 3.0. It's all about success, success. You know, do this, be the best at it. And um, and I, I think I think it terrifies people because then they get uh, they're afraid to go out of their the area that they're comfortable in because you know they're really good at this and they get lots of positive feedback. But if they go off there, then then bad things might happen, and yet, um, if you don't aren't willing to allow bad things to happen, I don't see how you grow. So I, I mean, I think that's a huge. I think that's a really big problem for kids in these kinds of schools. They're so used to being great at everything, and it's good to be bad at things, or it's good to take a chance. It's good to see where your limits are. It's good, and it's good to fail and try again, and then be successful. So I, I, I love that idea. Yeah, thank I don't you. Think good. we have nearly enough of it. 
the, the, I, it, it's funny because even as I've argued in that direction, I'm now going to argue against myself or, try, or, or be the devil's advocate. I understand the enormous pressure that is placed upon them uh, from a variety of corners for having that perfect uh, GPA. And so uh, we've done something at Wellesley uh, for, with our first year is the whole notion of shadow grading, which I find to be a, a, a wonderful opportunity for them to take the kind of risks, especially in their first semester at Wellesley when they're just making that uh, first transition so that they can learn the difference between learning for the grade and learn if they haven't already figured it out. Some of them have come into Wellesley having figured that out, but placing more importance on the learning than on the result. Uh, I love to use this, the sports metaphor of um, playing the game while you're watching the scoreboard. If your eye is on that scoreboard, if you're just looking for the results, it's actually going to affect how well you actually play the game. So, so it can help you to get your brain off of the grade thing. You can actually perform better if you can do that. But maybe I'm just getting old, but I feel like at this age, that's a hard thing to ask of someone, you know, who's especially first years, they're, they're 18 years old, 17, some of them. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Um, so given those pressures, do you think that Wellesley students are more reticent to commit to uh, a major in the performing arts than? There, I, I would say in general, the uh, I can only speak for the, the theater studies. It, it may be different because some of the performing arts have slightly different kinds of status at all liberal arts institutions. Music's relationship to math gives it a certain status, uh, particularly in, in the areas of composition and, and, and stuff like that. Um, dance in some liberal arts institutions can be a major. In some institutions, it's in the physical education department. So depending, and, and it's kind of why I wanted to talk about this, is, is I think there's an uneasy relationship uh, between the liberal arts as we see it today um, and the fine arts, and, and we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure it out. Um, so, so to answer your question, in theater studies what we find is that we have mostly double majors, um, and uh, when the faculty have a little joke about, you know, this major's for me and this major's for mom and dad, right? Um, um, but, but it makes a lot of sense in theater particularly because uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's a way of exploring. It's a way in, of engaging in close reading, um, critical thinking. Uh, I even refer to it as, as, as three-dimensional modeling because I love to borrow the language of other disciplines that are, be, that are being folded into pedagogy that we in the theater have used all the time. It, putting on a play is basically three-dimensionally modeling human behavior. And there are things or perspectives that you get from having gone through that experience that uh, inform in a way that just analysis alone uh, might not get you there. Given your lecture, though, isn't the, the double major antithetical to the liberal arts education? Because it sounds like that second major, if, if, because nobody is view, or the students are reticent to view the performing arts as job preparation, that second major is now viewed as job preparation, which seems to counteract the entire point. Yeah, I, I understand the nature of your question. And, I, and I, in, in, in general, I agree with you. Uh, but I would say the, I would argue in the opposite direction, that any major <laughs> is antithetical to the liberal arts idea. <laughs> because the idea is you're graduating having been put through the gauntlet of all these different departments that are challenging all these different intelligences. So that when you graduate, you're pretty good at figuring stuff out. Uh, and, and that is the long-term strategy. Of course, you have to major in something. And of course, you should, after spending four years here, you should have probably figured out what it is that gets you up in the morning and should have taken a, a greater combination of classes in that discipline. And, and by and large, they do. Where, where I totally agree with you is when the part of the brain that says, I have to get a job right after I graduate and I have to make money, that puts the liberal arts curriculum in, in more direct competition with other forms of training for specific skill sets. But because we know that over the course of uh, the, the graduating class's lifetime, they're going to change jobs. What is it, every seven years or something? Or the, the, the citations differ. But, but if, if we assume that you know, every decade they're changing a job, 
then there's no way that they're going that a specific skill set training program is going to prepare them for that fifth job. I'd love to make that claim. It sounds so pompous, but yes, I would love to make that claim. Um, they do. I mean, they, our student body is so diverse. There, there are people who are checking off boxes. There are people who are so directed that they, at, I don't know if it changes, but they come in here for a semester with every semester planned out. And there's other people who come to explore. You know, so um, I, um, I served for three years. I just stepped down this year from the... Um, uh, admissions committee, we rotate. And one of the things that we are trained to look for in that college essay is reflective writing. I saw this and it made me think about this and it changed how I saw the world. It doesn't matter what it's about. It could be about your ant farm collection or, or, or whatever. So the topic, and, and whenever I was talking to high school students about this, it was precisely that. Don't worry so much about what you're talking about. It's your passion for and what your interest in led you to conclude that is really the substance of your essay, and that's what we're looking for. Because there are a lot of really smart people in the world. I, you have to do a stint on the admissions committee to really appreciate how smart the people that are trying to get in here are. The, the, I don't want to throw statistics out because I'll probably be wrong, but a very large number of people who apply to Wellesley are qualified to come here. So it's not about that. It's about this reflective thinking because further on down the road, we want these people with these skill sets and these important jobs to be reflecting about the consequences of the decisions that they're making. We've kind of veered off to jobs and stuff like that. Any art for art's sake, people? I was, I was prepared to say, let's just have coffee. If you just believe in art for art's sake, let's just have coffee. <laughs> Without a doubt, there has to be art for art's sake. Yeah. yeah. And we, have, we, we graduate one or two majors every year who's going to go the distance. And, and it's funny because this is the lovely thing about um, the size of Wellesley, is we can take those folks under our, our wings, and the, the education doesn't stop after they graduate. You know, I, I, I currently have, a, I'm I directed a show that is now on tour. I actually just came back from Hartford, Connecticut, and we're going back out to Northampton. Um, and, and one of the people in the show, in a major role, is a Wellesley alum. Uh, and, and I don't know whether she believes me or not, but she was not cast because she's a former student. I always recuse myself from the initial conversation in casting whenever it's a student of mine. And I let the... Um, artistic director or the, the casting director say the first thing and it's at that point I disclose it. Yeah, that's one of mine I've trained. I've, I've trained her. I think she's great. If you want to work with her, yay, you're not going to get any opposition from me. But I never um, use the connection. I use the connection to tell them when the auditions are happening. And for me, that really helps me because it makes, it, it, it helps me control for my own uh, bias and, and, and aesthetic um, Preferences, right? I think she's great, but I've been working with her for four years. It might be Stockholm Syndrome, I don't know. <laughs> but this other person says, wow, who's that? I don't know, she's one of them. That, that reaffirms for me that, that yes, we're, 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 we're doing a good job with this one and, and, and the education is working. And the double major thing, I think largely, um, because they're not always uh, simply to get a job. I might have overcharacterized that. Sometimes it's just that it is possible to be fascinated by two things. And, and this place is a candy shop. I, I, when, I'm, when I'm talking to students, it's just it's more a question of I don't know what to major in because I want to major in everything. Um, but in some instances, we've had uh, uh, physics and theater double majors who, um, the, the one that I'm remembering, she wrote a children's musical about black holes that got picked up by the Museum of Science in Boston and went over there. So, so yeah. they can, th these disciplines can actually meet somewhere out there, too. I believe you bring acting to every place. Yeah, it's all acting. <laughs> you ask me, it's all acting.
and, and the acting scenario in the acting classes is just trying on different human situations. It's what theater does. It asks the question, not only the big questions about like, why are we here, but just how do I deal with this kind of situation? There isn't, there in a, there isn't a subject on which a play has not been written. And I usually say that to the students who are taking the course as a uh, requirement, as an arts requirement. Um, we have plays on physics. We have plays on nuclear responsibility. We have plays on just about any topic that it could be. So again, one discipline folds itself into the other discipline. Well, good. Oh, that's a tough question, especially because I'm being recorded. Um, <laughs> I would say that it really, it really depends on the, um, the assumptions of the student walking into the class. There are students who come in with a fair amount of experience. I mean, I've had, I've had students come into Wellesley with Broadway credits. Um, and I've had students come in, and the first thing they say to me at this introductory class is, I don't have any experience. Should I be taking this course? And, and so what I tell them is it is just as difficult to relearn your way around a bad performance habit as it is to learn something fresh from the first time. It's true with, with any skill. Um, I do have to say I have a particular fondness for student athletes because I love watching the light in their eye when they realize, oh my God, this is just the same thing as field hockey. You know? Oh, and, and, and the emotional sophistication of how to contain your emo not contain, how, how to put to use your emotions when in the face of conflict. I mean, this, this has implications far beyond both the performing arts and sports, right? Just civil dialogue. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Are you working with Janie Howland? No, I'm working with um, David. David Toland? Yeah. yeah. Um, th this is an, a completely different aspect of theater that I think um, informs uh, the liberal arts curriculum slightly differently, and specifically Wellesley as a women's college. There's a skill set that students coming out of a technical theater class have that um, I think stand women in really good stead out there in the job market. Um, our, our tech students take apart and put together electrical instruments. They know their way around electricity. They're not afraid of power tools. I mean, I, I don't want to make that whole sort of rah rah. You can go be a, you, you can go be any kind of uh, you know uh, profession that involves electricity uh, and stuff like that. But traditionally, it's not necessarily something that women are um, encouraged to do or um, have had access to. Um, before getting here. In some instances there are. Sometimes they're theater techies. They've been, you know, hanging off of grids since high school and, that, and that's great too. Um, I think where it actually uh, interacts more specifically with the pedagogy of a liberal arts college is the notion of the practical application of either uh, mathematical or engineering concepts. You, the, you have to be able to have, uh, uh, you have to have a certain skill set computationally just to do technical theater. And in terms of logistics and logistics training, this is, this is something that is rarely addressed in a liberal arts college unless you're working in lab sciences and doing the kind of, I love it, experiential and immersive learning. In the theater, we call that rehearsal. Right? I mean, but I, I love all these new terms that are sort of emerging in academia for pedagogical concepts that have existed in the theater you know, for centuries. Um, so so to, uh, to try to address your question more directly, um, I actually want to ask you, what do you think, uh, what do you think this is, has done for you in the context of the other classes? How does it inform the other classes uh, you've taken? I'm, I'm not really sure. Okay. Because like, yeah, I've only been here for four weeks. Oh gosh, oh gosh, that's, this is such a horrible question to ask you then. You're a first year. Oh, you're in for fun, yeah. Are you, do you know what you're going to major in? Um, maybe medieval studies, maybe English. Okay, great. 
right? So, so I, we can expect a thesis um, in, in you're going to mount a medieval play or something or, or design it or redesign it or reinvent it. Um, I, a, a friend of mine uh, who's in the English department was, uh, is actually writing about how medieval drama, between the connections between medieval drama and um, rock concerts, particularly heavy metal rock concerts. It's, it's not quite as uh, quaint and antiquated as we might think. Uh, uh, there's, there's still a tradition that comes down from the, the medieval plays that, that see their analog in contemporary art. So maybe that's, you know, that kind of connection. Well, great. Um, I'm going to hang around so if folks, I, I know that sometimes asking a question in a room in front of other people, but if you, if you want to chat about stuff. I brought some technology along, but I, I felt like um, you're all parents. You know that feeling where you want to show people your photos of your kids doing cool stuff? Uh, well, I've, I've got some of uh, the Spanish class folks. What I really, uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to photo document it, students who were really just could not get up on that stage. We let everybody into the class, so you, there was no performative experience necessary. So the people who, who really did not want to perform, we made the dramaturgs, so they had to go out and uh, research the period of the play and work with the actors and the directors on uh, appropriate movement for the piece. Would somebody cross their legs while sitting on a chair or not? Uh, how do you bless yourself in you know um, medieval Spain uh, and, and uh, that sort of thing? And then they presented in Spanish their research and watching them struggling to express important concepts and the fact that they were speaking in Spanish almost dropped away. Yes, they had their language uh, challenges, but it wasn't about the language anymore, so they weren't self-consciously watching themselves speaking in Spanish as they were speaking Spanish. They were just trying to express themselves in this language. Um, the footage is kind of fun, but uh, you know, I, you can imagine that you've seen it already. Good. So I'll, I'll hang around. I'll probably be around at lunch, too, so if, if, if I see you and you have a question, feel free to ask me. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of, of the weekend.